Let me welcome you to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Steve McDonald. I'm the director of the Africa programs and the project on leadership and building state capacity. We're going to begin this afternoon's uh, uh, event with a video presentation from Ben Affleck, the founder, one of the founders of the Eastern Congo Initiative. Thank you. this collaborative report on security sector reform in the DRC with the Eastern Congo Initiative. The Wilson Center holds special meaning for me. Congressman Howard Wolpe was kind enough to share his wisdom about Central Africa with me as I formulated the concept for ECI. He was a dedicated public servant and a compassionate friend. His legacy remains a guide and source of motivation for our work. I'm sorry not to be with you in person but I'm very thankful that my colleague and friend Cindy McCain is representing ECI at this event. She has been a great friend to Congo and dedicates her time, energy, and smarts to the efforts to increase investments and awareness about the situation in DRC. So thank you, Cindy. The needs of Congo's people remain as great as ever. Despite nearly a decade since the end of the war and billions of dollars in aid spent, the DRC remains in last place in the current United Nations Human Development Index, 187th out of 187 countries, the same place it's held every year since 2005. Violence, fear, and grinding poverty are the daily reality for many of Congo's 70 million citizens. There are a number of reasons for Congo's slow progress, the lack of infrastructure, underinvestment, and corruption, and the trauma of war. Yet underpinning these challenges is the problem of chronic insecurity. Though reduced in number since the end of the war, armed groups continue to prey on Congolese families and their communities. Perhaps most troubling, they are not the sole violators of human rights. The police, judiciary, and most importantly, the military, are all too often perpetrators rather than protectors. As a result, people suffer, investors are put off, the unemployed turn to militias to secure a living, and the cycle of violence continues. And yet, the Congolese remain hopeful. They know their country has extraordinary potential. Insecurity is not a new challenge. DRC advocates, including ECI, have repeatedly highlighted the need to reform the Congolese security sector. Multiple attempts at reform have been made by nearly every major international actor, Yet despite some isolated success stories, wholesale reform has failed. But let's be clear, progress is possible. Past attempts at military reform have failed mainly due to the lack of political will from sectors of the Congolese government and the shortfalls of the international community in encouraging the development of that political will. Both of these can change. With a new government taking shape in the DRC, the Congolese government and the international community have a new chance to work together toward real military reform. The recent elections give the Congolese government a fresh opportunity to rebuild its war-torn country. By enacting this critical reform, one that would benefit all sectors of society, from the poorest farmer in South Kivu to human rights activists, investors, and government officials, the government can demonstrate its true commitment to the prosperity of its people. The international community also has a vital role to play. In the past five years alone, donor countries have invested more than $14 billion into the DRC. Of this, only 1%, or $140 million, was spent on security sector reform. International aid is now equivalent to nearly half of the DRC's annual budget. Donors, therefore, hold both a unique position and a responsibility to spur the debate on improving security. Without an effective security sector, organized, trained, and resourced, we will never solve the tragedy of rape, the ravages of children in conflict, the violence of extreme poverty, and the illegal trade of conflict minerals. Simply put, we believe that an environment that continues to produce an unknown multitude of child soldiers needs to be reformed. We're here today to talk about a way forward. ECI has partnered with local and international civil society partners to produce a joint report taking a stand on security sector reform, which outlines our recommendations for achieving this goal. 
Numerous Congolese civil society groups and local leaders remind us that the Congolese people are ready to build a better country. As outlined in the report, the most important step to successful reform is for the Congolese government to renew its political commitment to improving the security sector and make military reform in particular a top political priority of the new government. It should remove from office those individuals obstructing military reform. Second, the Congolese government, with strong support from the U.S. government and other donors, should establish an effective coordination body and a high-level forum on security sector reform to streamline national and international reform efforts. Lastly, the U.S. government and international donors should develop clear benchmarks for progress. Such an improvement in the military's human rights record and an implementation of a military reform plan would go a long way towards solving the problems that have plagued DRC. The central aim of all these recommendations is to de develop the necessary political context in which efforts for reform can succeed. With the right political will in Kinshasa, endemic corruption can be tackled, salaries paid, and the worst abusers removed. Once the right conditions are in place, the long-term and large-scale work of reducing the size while increasing the effectiveness of the police and military can begin in earnest. I have been honored to work with Congolese leaders who are making progress in the face of remarkable odds. Together, this is a problem we can solve. However, our window of opportunity will not wait for us to act. Our continued failure or inaction will only reap catastrophic consequences. For Congo's people and for the region, we must stop the unnecessary destruction of lives and hope. I thank you all for your commitment to building a better future in Congo. And, and, and the, uh, the needs there, and uh, we offered to uh, help host him when he came out to Congo for that uh, subsequent trip, and our office director there of the uh, Initiative for uh, Cohesive Leadership, uh, Michelle Casa, was able to uh, brief him and, uh, and, and link him to uh, some of the activists in, the, in, the, uh, in North and South Kivu. Um, so we're very proud of his involvement, and, uh, and I'm very happy to hear his, uh, his uh, uh, testimony to Howard Wolpe and his role. He was deeply missed by us all. I would like to turn now to Cindy McCain to give us some introductory remarks. In 2009, Cindy helped uh, Ben to found the ECI. She's a lifelong advocate for the needy and for children's health care, founding the American Voluntary Medical Team and traveling regularly on behalf of the UN World Food Program to visit mother and child feeding initiatives around the world. So please welcome Cindy. Thank you. very much. I'm pleased to be here and I want to thank all of you for participating in this. Um, it is uh, it, this collaborative effort on behalf of security issues and reform in DRC is most important. And uh, your, the Eastern Congo Initiative has of course released this report and I'm just thrilled to have it on the radar screen and uh, right now. And I also would like to thank Ben Affleck for his tireless efforts in this arena. Um, he I, I like, everyone has a funny story, but I got a phone call one day from Ben Affleck, and I thought, okay, my boys are playing a joke on me. This is a joke. I, what, what in the world is this about? And what I found was a man that was not only dedicated uh, to this issue, but uh, a, a man that understands uh, the issue very deeply and is committed. And I'm very pleased to be able to call him a friend and call him a colleague uh, on this effort. So it is uh, for me, an honor to be here this afternoon. Uh, before I continue, I would like to pay tribute, though, to the memory of the late Lynn Lucy, who died March 17th. Uh, along with her husband, Joe, Lynn had devoted her life caring for victims of conflict uh, at Heal Africa Hospital, and I know many of you knew her here. And in the face of great challenges in Goma, like many, uh, the women and children are who she cared for. Uh, Lynn would have, made, would have been very interested in our discussion today, and as security sector reform is key to bringing the kind of peace that they so long for in the area. I've been to DRC s many times. Uh, I first went to Congo immediately during uh, the genocide uh, in Rwanda, wound up on the Zaire side at that time, uh, building a hospital and helping, helping 
uh, catch those who are coming across the border. And it is not something that leaves your heart easily. So clearly this area of the world has been um, uh, deeply embedded in my own fiber and one that I'm very grateful to be a part of now. I would like to focus uh, for a minute on my uh, most recent visits, uh, which happened last year. In July, I traveled to North Kivu and to Kinshasa as part of a delegation inquiring about the pre-election preparations. Uh, we talked to a diverse segment of society, including local election agents and UN national officials in Goma, villagers struggling to survive at the base of the volcano outside of Goma, as well as presidential advisors, national party leaders, and candidates in Kinshasa. In November, I returned with a team uh, from ECI to observe the elections in the city of Goma and surrounding rural areas. As it is often the case, these experiences were the most rewarding. But they, were all, they also revealed the long road that we have ahead. These elections were supposed to build on the great hope that the 2006 elections represented for the DRC as the Congolese people moved out of the shadow of one of the most destructive conflicts the world has ever known. But instead, both the electoral process and the aftermath of the polls further heightened the continued state of insecurity that has been the daily lot of the civilian populations. The recent post-election violence in Kinshasa, emergence of, a new, of new militias, and ensuing heightened tensions in eastern DRC further underscore the pressing need for security sector reform. As a mother, I am particularly worried about the most vulnerable members of society, women and children, who continue to pay the highest price for, for continued insecurity and for the violence that flares up and threatens their lives and livelihood every day. Malnutrition, high infant mortality rates, high risk childbearing, and the lack of adequate maternal care take a heavy toll on millions of Congolese families every day. In areas where militiamen rule uh, unrestrained, sexual violence remains the scourge that, dis that destroys women as it rips apart the very fiber of their communities. As we gather here today, boys and girls are being abducted by armed groups and being forced to serve either as combatant or sex slaves. This senseless violence has become part of life despite the presence of the United Nations' largest pe peacekeeping mission and, and a great cons consternation of con concentration of Congolese troops in the region. 1.7 million Congolese are internally displaced, with an additional half million and growing refugees living outside the country. Further, and quite disheartening, is the reality that the DRC will miss all of its Millennium Development Goals as it now is in last place in the UN UNDP, UNDP developmental rankings, 187 out of 187. The primary cause of this suffering is continued insecurity, the Congolese government's inability to protect its people or control its territory undermines progress at an on everything else. An effective security sector, organized, resourced, and trained is essential to solving problems from displacement, recruitment of child soldiers, and gender-based violence, to economic growth, or the illicit mineral trade. Still, I firmly believe that this situation is reversible. Like many of you who have worked in Congo, I embrace the Congolese people's resourcefulness, great pride in their country, and their spirit of resilience. Congo, however, will not rebuild its once vibrant public health and economic sectors and get back on track so long as it lacks a competent, professional army that is accountable to its people. Without a security force, both military and police, to provide a security blanket and a safety net to the Congolese insecurity, to the Congolese, insecurity will continue to keep this country from achieving its full potential. Women and children will continue to bear the brunt of the conflict and human rights violations as the perpetrators live in total impunity. 
Congolese leaders and their inter international partners are at a critical crossroads. They can either do business as usual, maintaining the status quo with all the known ramifications, or they can marshal the necessary political will and willpower and come together in a meaningful way, articulating a clear vision for a security sector reform and providing the crucial assistance to achieve it. Reform that is led by the Congolese government and civil society and aided by the international community is the first step. It's the first step on the road to peace, security, and prosperity in DRC. And today I stand with the Congolese people and support their dream and right to peaceful existence. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Cindy. We appreciate your remarks. We appreciate your passion. <laughs> we appreciate your engagement. Um, I'm now going to ask uh, our panel to come forward uh, and take their seats up front here. Uh, that'll be uh, Carl Wyckoff, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for African Affairs at the State Department, and Vimba uh, Disolele, who's ECI Fellow and uh, an old colleague an expert on the DRC, and Emmanuel um, uh, Kambangeli, who's the National Coordinator for the Network for Security Sector Reform and Justice in the DRC. Uh, gentlemen, if you'll come forward and be seated. <laughs> As they're coming forward, if you haven't figured it out by now, uh, we will be having some of the presentations in French. So if you need earphones for translation, uh, don't speak both languages. Uh, uh, now is the time to get them. Uh, French is going to be on channel one and English on channel two. <laughs> okay. Before I ask the panel to make their presentation and open the floor for exchange and dialogue, let me just add uh, how delighted we are to host the launch of this report today. Um, I hope you've all picked up some copies. Uh, as uh, as you as as Ben and and Cindy were saying, this is a co uh, uh, actually a, a collaboration, a coalition of thirteen leading international and Congolese civil society groups representing. Over, uh, uh, over 350 NGOs and CSOs uh, from uh, around the world uh, who, really who wrote and approved this report and, and who support its findings. I won't go into the, uh, the uh, substance of the report because I think both Cindy and Ben have, uh, have uh, adequately uh, laid out its general provisions and recommendations. Um, I, I do want to say that the Wilson Center has long been involved in the Eastern Congo and working with the community government and military leaders to create a platform for reconciliation and a form of cohesive leadership to deal with the problems of insecurity and the lack of governance. We have more recently been working with the State Department to implement a security sector reform program that engages the regi regimental commanders of North and South Kivu in this effort. Uh, our work and this report come at a critical time. Changes are underway in the Kivus and within the National Army Command structure, particularly with the recent developments as regards Abasco and Taganda and the recent uh, order by the President uh, just a few days ago for his arrest. And an admission by the President, which I think is very important and should be, he should be taken at his word, that there are structural problems within the military hierarchy, the word he used, uh, and that the need to rebuild trust and rebuild that uh, hierarchy is, is really important. While these are only very small openings for us, of course, through which we all feel the need to drive a truck, the question will be, is there space? Uh, is, the, is, is the infamous corruption that permeates the, uh, the armed forces too big to overcome? If reform is to happen, by whom and at what levels? So let's begin to address some of these questions and others. I'll ask each of the panelists to speak for about five to eight minutes, then we'll hopefully have time for a, an exchange with the audience. I, I won't introduce them further than the titles I gave because you have their full bios before you. So with no further ado, uh, Carl, I'll ask you to begin. Good afternoon. Thank you for that, uh, Steve. Um, uh, I'm Carl Wyckoff, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. I would just start uh, with a, a deep felt uh, word of appreciation, uh, both to the Wilson Center, to Steve, and to the staff here, and especially to the ECI, uh, the Eastern Congo Initiative, and to the partners that it has, as well as to kind of you know uh, non-governmental organizations and civil society writ large. Uh, as the U.S. government works on issues, sticky, difficult issues like uh, defense sector reform, uh, security sector reform in the DRC, 
uh, we are dependent on a number of partners, both in other governments, obviously in the DRC, uh, but in Europe, in Africa, and elsewhere, uh, but also with a broad range of uh, people who've developed a deep expertise in that set of problems, and, and to be able to share uh, ideas and to have a dialogue with them is very important to us. So for me, it's a pleasure to be here. I would just note that for me personally, I have been an advocate of and a worker bee on defense sector reform in the DRC now for almost five years. I uh, have had the pleasure of trying to understand the set of problems that we're dealing with uh, and to design programs, diplomatic approaches, and what have you to try to make some progress. It is a difficult uh, set of issues, uh, but uh, certainly has been a priority for the State Department and for the U.S. government as a whole. Uh, we're focused on DSR, on defense sector reform, security sector reform. I would just state the obvious. Uh, as, our, as has been made clear by uh, the initial presentations on this, that the DRC's got a host of issues to deal with uh, and that the U.S. government approach uh, works uh, across the board uh, to try to help stabilize the DRC. I would say that the principal U.S. foreign policy goal uh, for us in the DRC has been the emergence of a stable and well-governed nation that's at peace with its neighbors and provides uh, for the basic needs of its citizens. And as I mentioned, we have a broad diplomatic AID and other set of programs and policies to try to advance that interest. Uh, regarding uh, security sector reform, uh, I would just, and I do have some prepared remarks that I'll go through here quickly. Uh, I would just note that uh, there's been decades of neglect by the Mobutu regime uh, that's left the security sector not only weakened, but internally conflicted creating serious governance concerns within all the security services. Since Kabila's government came to power in 2006, the USG has increased its attention and resources to assist the government of the DRC in maintaining peace and security within its borders. Indeed, the stability of the DRC is critical to peace and security in the entire Central African region, uh, given the country's size, location, and resources. The ability of the DRC to provide a military and police force that can respond to the basic security needs of the population while respecting human rights and providing protection is an urgent priority to be pursued along other aspects of development. To achieve sustainable security within the DRC and throughout the region, a complete reform of the Congolese security sector is required. A successful SSR process will require significant commitment on the part of senior Congolese leaders, including the President, the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Interior, and the Ministry of Justice. The security sector, which includes the military, police, and judicial system, suffers from decades of corruption, mismanagement, and little or no maintenance or development of personnel or assets to support these institutions. We're starting, in other words, from a very low base. There is, in essence, little history of an independent judiciary in the DRC or of a professionalized military. In general, the USG has applied a long-term and a holistic approach for assisting the DRC undertake comprehensive and lasting security sector reform. We have in this endeavor paid special attention to sex and gender-based violence and to child soldiers as two particularly troubling and important issues. Our strategy for assisting with SSR in the DRC is guided by a number of overarching principles and practices, which include the following. Our commitment is, is uh, to achieving desired outcomes must be long-term. Uh, given the depth of these problems, there's a long-term commitment from the U.S. government to this issue, to security sector reform. Our efforts, activities, and programs must perforce have a Congolese lead in commitment if they are to be effective and sustainable over the long term. The Congolese themselves must work with donor nations, neighboring countries, and multinational institutions to implement the necessary reforms. USG coordination and synergy with other donor countries is essential. Good governance in a society in, as a whole that respects human rights and the rule of government are fundamental to ensuring uh, SSR success. I would also note that all participants in U.S. government training programs are fully vetted for human rights uh, violations in their past, uh, and that all of our programs are designed to promote respect for human rights um, as well as military proficiency. 
The lack of a functioning security sector in the DRC has cultivated a culture where human rights abuses are rampant and victims have little judicial recourse as perpetrators enjoy impunity. Assisting to build the institutional and operational capacity of the military, police, and judicial sectors while simultaneously inculcating them with respect for the human rights of civilian populations is fundamental to the success of the DRC's stability, security, and the consolidation of democracy in that country, the advancement of democracy in that country. We recognize that the DRC has struggled to make meaningful progress in the implementation of security sector reforms and has had little success holding security forces accountable for their human rights violations. Holding civilian and military human rights abusers accountable, including culpable senior officers, general officers and other senior officers, is an essential element for ending impunity and creating effective military and police security services. In addition, despite several attempts by the GDRC to bring ex-rebel groups into its ranks, certain groups, including elements of the ex-CNDP, have only nominally integrated into the force and continue to operate independent from the formal command structure. This separate command structure not only presents challenges to the reform process, the security sector reform process, but threatens the authority of the government to hold those soldiers accountable for their actions and consolidate government authority in the East. True stability in Eastern Congo will require a professional military. A key element to creating this professional military will be to vet, fully integrate, and establish centralized command and control over the former armed groups which have been nominally integrated into the Congolese military, the FARDC. The United Nations Organization, the United Nations Organization Stabilization Mission, the DRC, known as MONUSCO, is presently the most reliable security force in the country committed to protect the population. Overall, this security deficit creates an environment rife for spoilers, and this we must find ways to deal with. A word about our objectives for the security sector reform in the DRC. Professional security forces must be paid, fed, housed, professionally trained and led, and must adhere to standards for interacting with civilians and other security forces, including respect for human rights. Congolese institutions require substantial reform and resources to support these principles. To reform these institutions, the GDRC will need to commit to the reform process, impress upon both security forces leaders and rank and file that there is no impunity for criminality, and allocate resources to support their forces, sustain a payment structure and personnel tracking system that will ensure that security force members are paid, and develop training programs and doctrine to advance their capability and ensure that there is continuity across the, forth, uh, across the forces, both military and police. Improved recruiting procedures to include the recruitment of women and other underrepresented populations into the security forces must be established. And of course, child soldiers must be excluded from the ranks. Bolstering the capacity of the military justice system is a key tenet of the overall reforms. And there, again, here there's a special emphasis on reducing and eliminating sex, sex, sex and gender-based violence. It's a top priority for the U.S. Development of the security sector is a critical component of ensuring the long-term goal of a stable DRC as it comes to be seen as the primary mediator of conflicting interests. Without a strong and legitimate security sector, people will seek alternative means to settle disputes and impunity will endure. If I could, a word about our coordination effort. Coordination is critical to USG efforts in reforming the Congolese security sector. This includes coordination between sectors and amongst the Congolese, the international community, both in Kinshasa and at capitals level, and in the US interagency, including the State Department, DOD, AFRICOM, Treasury, Justice, and others. The Congolese must lead and participate in coordination mechanisms and fully commit to the reform process and accept a multilateral and collaborative approach. The success of security sector reform is dependent upon the GDRC's political will, planning, and resource capacity and legal frameworks. The U.S. will continue to support the DRC's efforts to emerge from conflict and realize a just and lasting peace based on democratic principles governed by the rule of law and respectful of human, ri respectful of human rights. We will continue to be a strong advocate for systemic SSR and particularly defense sector reform, both with the senior levels of the government of the DRC and with the international community at large. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. We appreciate that. Uh, in Vimba. Mm -hmm. 
I would like to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center for hosting this important forum. I would also like to thank uh, the Congolese and international civil society organizations, more than 300 of them, that came together and made this report possible. Finally, I would like to thank you in the audience for your interest in DRC. The report is appropriately named Taking a Stand on Security Sector Reform because continued insecurity is the primary cause of suffering in DRC. The Congo conflict, which has gone on too long in various forms, has taken on an acceptable toll on the people of DRC, affecting all Congolese. A lack of political will at the highest levels of Congolese government is the root of the failure to implement security sector reform. The government of DRC, which has the primary responsibility to protect the Congolese people, has also failed to articulate a vision for security and to marshal assistance among international donors to achieve it. But we believe that uh, DRC civil society and the government, in partnership with the international community, have the responsibility to take a clear, unambiguous stand on security sector reform. Over the last uh, decade, security sector reform has been crippled by poor coordination among donors who are driven primarily by competing short-term uh, short imperatives and objectives. This approach has yielded uh, piecemeal intervention as the government of DRC has managed to play off donors against each other through bilateral agreements. The resulting failures have led many to give up on systemic reform altogether. Thus, the international community shares significant responsibility with the government of Congo. Little has been spent on security sector reform, despite its paramount strategic importance. Between 2006 and 2010, official development aid dispersed for conflict, peace, and security totaled just about $530 million, roughly 6% of total aid, excluding debt relief. Spending directly related to security sector management and reform is even lower, $84 million, just 1%. The Congolese people want peace, and with more political will, sustainable reform is possible. The investment made by Congo's partners should not go to waste, or the people will continue to suffer. A lack of political cohesion among donors after the 2006 elections undermined effective joint pressure on the RC government. We are asking for the international community to shepherd greater political will and show political cohesion in pressuring and assisting the Congolese government on effective security sector reform. After all, it is the key to sustainable peace in Congo. Today, through this report, Congolese civil society organizations and their international counterparts and partners are in fact saying that enough is enough. The time has come to end the suffering to a comprehensive reform of sector security institution, which include the military, law enforcement institutions such as the police and the courts, as well as customs and revenue agencies. After the 2006 elections, the democratically elected government of Congo made remarkable economic gains. DRC coasted through the global financial crisis relatively unscathed. In 2010, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank approved a, a $12.3 billion debt relief package to help alleviate Kinshasa's financial burden, which was part of the Mobutu legacy. And largely because of investment in the country's extractive sector, particularly copper, the World Bank expects Congo economy to grow over the next several years at around 7% annually, one of the fastest growth rates, not just in Africa, but in the world. These gains notwithstanding, no meaningful and sustainable economic development and growth can happen in DRC with this prevalent level of insecurity. It is hard to rebuild a country when you, you cannot protect your most valuable resources, men, women, and children. It is equally hard to rebuild when only a few people in power and those with guns benefit from the vast mineral resources. The lack of com competent security and law enforcement institutions have exacerbated the illegal exploitation and cross-border smuggling of resources. 
armed groups and their affiliates control mining areas and trade routes and tax activities in the areas of influence. Furthermore, the haphazard integration of milit militias into the National Army has far-reaching negative consequences. On one hand, it prolongs human rights abuses by militias, a newly integrated element of the National Army. On the other hand, it preserves the culture of impunity as part of the arrangement between the government and leaders of armed groups, making the prosecution and that of the associates difficult. This is why we are calling for a robust security sector reform. This reform is overdue. The Congolese people want and deserve peace. We should empower them to let the fight. The Congolese government's inability to protect its people or control its territory undermines pro progress on any other front. A, com a competent professional military, which is organized, resourced, trained and vetted is essential to solving these problems, from displacement, recruitment of child soldiers, gender-based violence to economic growth or the trade in conflict minerals. Without such a competent military, the DRC is unable to stop the proliferation of militias. Instead, the government of the DRC has chosen to compromise with militiamen and co-opt them into the National Army with no disruption of their rank and file. The lack of an adequate national integration program has resulted in the establishment of parallel commands and structures within the National Army. This means that the militias who join the National Army remain in their areas of control and keep their command nearly intact. This arrangement allows the former militiamen to perpetrate abuses on the civilian populations and keep their access to local resources all under the protection of a Congolese uniform. The November elections and the violence that ensued and human rights abuses by security forces expose the deficiency of the security sector. Now is the perfect time to encourage the government of DRC to present a detailed security sector reform plan that the international community can implement, can help implement. Only after the DRC undertakes a deep and meaningful security reform can the people of the DRC enjoy, really enjoy peace. Progress in security sector reform is tangible and quantifiable. With the Congolese government leading that effort and the international support for in, uh, security sector reform, progress can be made and safely improved. For, uh, for instance, the continued presence of militia leaders that operate with impunity within the Congolese military is one palpable element of security sector reform that requires immediate attention. Effective reform is a continuous effort, but the result can be measured sooner with specific and tangible benchmarks, including the disarmament and the mobilization of militias, the integration of qualified former combatants into the National Army, and the unification of structures and command into one single and strong line of command from Kinshasa. We believe, however, that the U.S. needed to increase its engagement to include assistance to DRC with the design of the security sector reform master plan coordination among DRC's international partners, especially the Western donor community. Above all, the U.S. military, which has a long history in the DRC, should help with the training of the Congolese armed forces and other security and law enforcement institutions. International donors provide more than half of the DRC budget. This fact places the international community in prime position to steer the government of Congo to focus efforts on this important aspect of Congolese progress. For security uh, reform to be effective and sustainable, DRC must lead its design and implementation, but the international community should work closely with the DRC to achieve this goal. Thank you. Thank you, Evemba. Uh, Emmanuel, vous, va présen vous allez présenter en français, n'est-ce pas? Right. Oui, oui. Oh, okay. Oui. So this is going to be in French for those who need it. Carry on. Okay, Emmanuel. So uh, thank you. Uh, I want to speak uh, in English, but my level of spoken English is bad. I will speak to you in French. Mm -hmm. Je m'appelle Emmanuel Kabingele Kalongi. 
Je suis Congolais de la République démocratique du Congo où je preste comme coordonnateur national du réseau pour la réforme du secteur de sécurité et justice qui est une plateforme de plus de 289 organisations de la société civile engagées dans la thématique de réforme du secteur de sécurité et justice à travers des actions de monitoring plaidoyer et lobbying. Et nous nous retrouvons justement ici dans le cadre d'un plaidoyer international et national parce qu'au même moment que nous sommes ici, il y a une série d'actions euh, qui sont en train d'être menées au niveau du pays, toujours dans le cadre du lancement de ce rapport. Et notre souci, c'est d'attirer davantage l'attention des partenaires de la République démocratique du Congo et du gouvernement congolais dès l'urgence qu'il y a à prendre position sur la réforme du secteur sécuritaire en République démocratique du Congo. Ce rapport, nous en sommes co-auteurs au nom de la société civile congolaise, plus particulièrement au nom de notre plateforme. Il est presque vidé de sa substance par mes prédécesseurs, au point que nous allons simplement essayer de voir quelques points d'attention spéciale, ce qui fait que notre exposé sera plus court. Pour rappel, euh, l'évolution de la situation sécuritaire actuelle en République euh, démocratique du Congo est décevante et a atteint presque le seuil du tolérable parce qu'à un moment donné, on est presque en train de tourner en rond. Les mêmes choses décriées hier, aujourd'hui on les décrit et notre souci, c'est que demain on ne puisse plus les décrier. Plusieurs personnes déplacées, plus de 1,7 million du fait des groupes armés, il y a plusieurs groupes armés à l'est du pays, ce rapport et détaillé là-dessus, vous aurez un certain nombre de données là-dessus. L'UNICEF estime que des milliers d'enfants assurent encore des diverses fonctions au sein de ces groupes armés. C'est encore une lutte qu'on se doit de faire. Plusieurs exactions commises à l'encontre de la population congolaise sont non seulement le fait des groupes armés, et c'est même une affirmation forte du rapport que nous soutenons, mais aussi de services congolais de sécurité, plus spécialement des forces armées de la République démocratique du Congo. La République démocratique du Congo, ça c'est un élément capital du rapport que je voudrais souligner, a reçu une aide extérieure très importante dans la période entre 2006 et 2010 qui s'élève à plus de 14 milliards de dollars par an et le coût de la mission de l'Organisation des Nations Unies à plus d'un milliard de dollars par an. Mais tous ces investissements n'ont pas donné lieu à des changements significatifs dans la vie des Congolais. La population continue à vivre dans une extrême pauvreté avec une moyenne de presque 50 centimes de dollars par jour, la moitié d'un dollar, comme revenu national brut. Comme vous le savez, et ce n'est pas un secret, le pays occupe aujourd'hui la dernière place du classement annuel. On a eu à nous le rappeler au début de cette séance, alors qu'il est l'un des rares pays au monde à avoir des ressources naturelles les plus importantes qui ne profitent qu'à une petite bourgeoisie alors que la population reste dans une situation qu'on ne sait pas qualifier. La cause centrale de toute cette souffrance est le rapport est plus précis là-dessus et à trouver dans la persistance de l'insécurité qui est le fait, comme je venais de le dire, pas seulement de groupes armés, mais aussi de services congolais de sécurité. 
Ainsi, la réforme du secteur sécurité, qui est presque les cadets de l'aide internationale, peut être comme une réponse à ce problème, mais c'est encore pour le moment une réponse dans le discours. Sincèrement, dans le discours, il y a des engagements. Lorsque euh, euh, il y a des discours politiques au niveau de messe politique au Congo, on priorise toujours la réforme du secteur sécuritaire et avec beaucoup de solennité, mais dans les actes concrets, nous avons besoin qu'il y ait de signes positifs là-dessus. Les temps passent, la population continue à vivre dans le désespoir. À un moment donné, on se demande qui viendra réellement nous sortir de ce gouffre. Les efforts militaires entrepris ont échoué tant pendant la période de transition qu'après, du fait justement, et ça c'est notre analyse en tant que société civile congolaise, de déficit de volonté politique euh, de la part de notre gouvernement. Il ne s'agit pas là d'un constat nouveau, c'est ce que certains pourraient nous dire, mais pour nous, l'instauration d'un secteur de sécurité constitue une étape importante pour remplir l'ensemble des objectifs, qu'il s'agisse de mettre un terme à la crise humanitaire, d'empêcher des atteintes aux droits humains, d'encourager l'investissement et la croissance, d'éliminer le commerce de minéraux liés au conflit ou de prévenir une escalade des tensions régionales. Il est largement admis, c'est une affirmation forte du rapport que vous allez trouver dans le rapport, qu'une sécurité est un impératif économique, géostratégique et de développement. Donc, sans sécurité, on ne peut pas parler de développement. Et lorsque on va investir à un endroit où se posent des problèmes de sécurité, si je crois que ça, ce sont des investissements qui ne sont pas à caractère durable. Le gouvernement congolais doit reconnaître le besoin urgent d'une réforme sérieuse en vue d'instaurer un secteur efficace et professionnel, surtout militaire. C'est le vœu le plus ardent de le rapport. Notre souci, ce n'est pas que l'on coupe le robinet de l'aide. Euh, international. Mais notre souci, c'est que l'on doit davantage, que l'on puisse être davantage regardant par rapport à l'aide que l'on apporte, par rapport aux priorités, par rapport à l'impact social de cette aide. Et c'est ça les soucis majeurs de ce rapport. Je vous remercie. Merci, Emmanuel. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. Uh, we now have a, a full half an hour for questions and uh, comments from the audience. Uh, first of all, let me remind you that we're being webcast live uh, so that uh, when, you get, uh, when you're going to ask a question or make a comment, wait for the microphone to come and identify yourself so the people who are listening and watching know who you are and can hear you. Okay, so we'll take probably two or three comments and questions at a time. I see the one right here to begin with. Thank you very much for giving me the mic. My name is uh, Major Andre Pika. I'm probably the only survival graduate of the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, <laughs> class of 1974. <laughs> the reason why I say that, I'm the only survivor because all my colleagues, those who went through the college and those who were trained here in the US and went back in the Congo and served in the armed forces of Zaire are no longer alive. Why? Because they were all killed by the government that's leading the country today, by the Kabila government. And 
that's a fact. I'm very surprised to hear everything that I heard here. I'm not even sure if we're talking about the East Congo only, or we're talking about the Democratic Republic of the Congo as a whole. Because a lot of the things that I hear are referring mostly to the Eastern Congo. Eastern Congo is not the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Now, when they talk about the armed forces, I was part of the armed forces. I was trained here in the U.S. from second lieutenant, went to ranger school, airborne school, Fort Benning, special forces, Fort Bragg, and I went back and served at Camp Chachi. So it really hurts my heart when I hear that the reform of the military, there is a lack of political will. If there have been a lack of political will in the last 10 years, why is the international community continuing to support those who lacked to put the army together? Should I conclude that they did not want any army so they can stay in power? I know the four factors that keep somebody in power. International support, local support, a lot of money, and the military. Those are the four facts. Now, the facts of not building up a good military in the Congo, was it to fulfill those four objectives? I would think yes. That's the reason why there was no political will. But what I'm saying today, what I'm asking the international community, that they should go by what the people of the Congo want. The people of the Congo want somebody who will have the political will to put the armed forces together. We are repeating ourselves. What I hear here, I tell you the truth, I went through all this, and what I hear here is just like if we were doing theory stuff. We are not going based on the facts. I'm sorry that okay, thank you, Major I, I'm raising the voice. I think you've made your point and you're beginning to repeat yourself. Thank you very much. As a fellow Fort Benning graduate, I appreciate your background. Thank you. We will take up your question. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Second one I saw was back here. Hello. Uh, I'm proud to inform that I am a proud Congolese American <laughs> of recent time. Uh, one of the issues raised by one of the speakers was a request to the U.S. to increase the level of its engagement in the Congo. And I did not hear anything about the same request, for example, on the side of the European Union, and especially France and Belgium, both of which have some special uh, connection to that country. My second question is, given all the problems that we have heard, how was it possible for an incumbent president to win an election? Could you comment? Could you comment about that? It's very strange to me. Thank you very much. Very interesting question. I saw one right here. Yes. Uh, thank you. My name is Jack. I'm a Congolese also. Like my uh, Congolese said, I am. I'm shocked. How are you talking? What country are you talking about? You really say that there is no political will to change things in Congo. And I was surprised during everybody intervention from Ben Affleck, um, Cindy McCain, everybody, no one said anything about democracy. We need democracy in Congo. We made a clear choice on 28th of November, a clear choice. Maybe you don't know who won the election. Congolese people know. The guy who keeps saying every time that his main priority once in the office is the army. A chance second. You don't like him, we don't know why. And you keep saying that you want to ask the government who have been in place for 12 years doing the same thing like Emmanuel Kabengele said. We said oh, we have to reform the army. For 12 years, nothing happened. You don't want to change him. You're calling him president. We're asking the government of Congo. Which government? 
we Congolese people right now, we are working hard. We're fighting with anything we have to install democracy, like in this country. Then democracy will bring justice, and justice will bring peace. Reform the army will be easy. I'm very shocked. I'm glad that one person for State Department is a big disappointment, sir. You have been reading this paper. I don't know if you know anything about Congo. We need that, that a true message. Go tell Obama, everybody, we need first democracy. Let Congolese people make their choice respected. In 28, November of 28, we made it clear how President is a change to Sekedi. Work with him because the guy said, not because his name is Echenti Sekedi, he has been fighting for 30 years for democracy, but he said that his first priority want in the office is the army. But for you guys, the guy you protect, a political enemy also known as Joseph Kabila, he doesn't care about army. He helped the militia. He has his own militia. You know after the election how many people do the army kill. And I was again, Congolese people were surprised. Two weeks before the election, United States of America armed the police, and those police killed Congolese people. So you have to be clear what you want for Congo. What do you want for Congo? We need democracy like you. We Thank need to be enjoy democracy like you. We need democracy. Let us make our choice and respect our choice. Thank, Thank you, you, Jack. We appreciate your comments. Very well said. I think what we're talking about in terms of political will, right down here. Political will is in terms of that government you're speaking about, which you don't see as legitimate. Okay, this will be our last question for this round. Thanks very much, Andrew Hudson from Crisis Action. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, Mr. Wyckoff, particularly uh, about what you think the, the U.S. government can do on this topic. Uh, <clears throat> the U.S. government obviously has um, benchmarking and conditions in aid that it gives to other countries. Colombia is a prime example where there are very detailed human rights conditions uh, in, in laws and the State Department obviously has to certify that those conditions are being met before portions of aid can be given. Do you think that that, that sort of a model might apply to, to Congo as well, specifically in relation to, to army reform, military reform? Okay, thank you. I think that gives us enough to comment on, uh, talking about democracy, the elections, uh, the Ill illegitimacy of the current government in certain people's eyes. Uh, how do you work within this environment? And, uh, I think we can start with you, Carl, because the last question was issued at you, but everyone should comment. Sure. No, I'm happy to. Um, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, since this is a panel about defense sector, security sector reform, that was the focus mm -hmm. for re my remarks. I think I did mention in there that our overarching goal for the, for the DRC is to have a well-governed and stable government. I think there was also a reference to uh, promoting democracy uh, as a whole, uh, the, the entire uh, focus on the security sector reform effort that we have is to promote uh, within that security sector, uh, both police, military, and in the justice sector, uh, a comprehensive approach uh, that will result in uh, the security sector that the Congolese people and government need. Uh, in terms of the elections, I think we're well on record in terms of the uh, view that we have of the elections, the flaws uh, in the run-up to the elections, the flaws in the electoral process uh, on the day and, and in the aftermath of the elections through the counting process. I also think that we ha are on record in, in both uh, in publicly and have made uh, numerous uh, uh, demarches and, and had advocacy, strong advocacy with senior levels of the GDR of the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo in terms of the importance of taking the reports uh, of human rights violations in the, in the run-up to the elections, election day and after election, and ensuring that there is a proper investigation of uh, any reports of uh, human rights violations, and those reports need to be inv uh, investigated, and that uh, any uh, perpetrators need to be brought to justice. Uh, from my perspective, very clear that our overarching goal in the DRC has been to promote uh, the democracy in a, a stable and well-governed state. As I mentioned, this is a long-term effort. Uh, certainly in the defense sector reform, we have a long-term lens uh, in terms of promoting uh, in improved conditions for the Congolese people, uh, trying to mitigate uh, the miseries uh, that have been so well addressed uh, here today in, in, in uh, numerous fora and reports. Uh, we have a, a very broad-based AID uh, approach 
uh, working with the UN, working with MONUSCO, working with a number of international organizations to try to, to address the, uh, the, the difficult conditions, but also in terms of the long-term effort, mid, short, mid, and long-term effort to improve governance in the DRC, uh, be it in the Ministry of Justice or the Ministry of Defense, kind of across the board. Uh, so, uh, from my perspective, that continues to be the major focus for the U.S. government. In terms of our security sector work, I would just highlight in, uh, that there is, again, a, a short, mid, and long-term approach to what we're doing. We have, for instance, an advisor embedded in the Ministry of Defense. Uh, there are a number of advisors uh, that work with the Ministry of Defense. Our goal there is to promote the the political will and the ability of the Minister of Defense, the Chief of Defense uh, Staff, uh, as well as uh, those in the Presidency and, and elsewhere. I think I mentioned the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Justice in my remarks, uh, to help to coordinate and to promote a systemic security sector reform process. Uh, we have, uh, just in terms of international coordination, the European Union is a very good partner for us and its member states. Someone mentioned France and Belgium. I think they are engaged uh, with the international community, certainly with the United States and, and with, the, with the government, uh, to, to try to put in peace those places. Should it be the training of a particular battalion or should it be uh, the European Union's chain of payment? A uh, long-standing effort there to improve the ability of, uh, of the FARDC to, to be paid. Uh, that there is close collaboration there and, uh, and an effort to work out a division of labor. We have one of our officers embedded, uh, works full-time with USEC uh, to, to make certain that our efforts, multi-million dollar program, mm -hmm. long-standing program <coughs> since 2006 uh, on systemic se uh, security sector reform. I also mentioned in my remarks in terms of uh, sex and gender-based violence and child soldiers being a priority, military justice, uh, working with the EU, for instance, to try to make certain that there are uh, identification cards for each member of the FARC. I believe the census has been completed, uh, reveals uh, just over 100,000 FARDC members, and, and to try to use that process to weed out child soldiers, make sure they're not recruited, make sure that they're not uh, allowed to stay, uh, even if they're with a, uh, a so-called integrated militia force that's been brought into the FARD, because that's a chronic, a chronic set of problems. On the military justice and ending impunity, uh, we have uh, uh, several projects, again, coordinated with uh, many of our civil society partners in terms of trying to ensure that a victim of, uh, of uh, sex or gender-based violence, a rape victim, uh, has the full gamut of uh, support that she needs in order to come forward in what might be very difficult circumstances to make the report, to encourage that to be done, uh, and working with uh, AID and with many others to try to put in place the things that are necessary there. For the sec defense sector, for the security sector, we have worked very hard, uh, both from an advocacy standpoint with the most senior levels of the DRC, uh, also with the command staff to ensure that the uh, military justice system in the DRC is improved. We've done uh, advisors, we have done a tremendous amount of training, we have an equipping program to try to bring up a digital uh, evidence system uh, so that there's a, there are databases that can be used in terms of prosecuting individual cases, but also in the longer term that could be used for the DRC to vet, and I mentioned this in my remarks. One of the key features uh, to defense sector reform is going to have to be a vetting process within the FARDC. So there has been a, a systemic approach to this. The EU very much takes a systemic approach, and we've tried to partner with them. Uh, they have been focused, I mentioned the chain of payments, they've been focused on logistics, administrative training, there's a, a list in the report as well, I believe, of some of the priorities for the EU. Uh, we have tried to, uh, to, to work on the logistics uh, uh, center also, the logistics uh, needs, I should say, with our defense institutions a defense institutions reform initiative, just to, to, to try to work across the board. Uh, but this question of political will and how best to, both for the international community and for the DRC, how to promote, promote more effective work very much on our agenda. Mm -hmm. And at this stage, all I can say is that we will continue uh, to have that a focal point for us. Uh, we meet regularly with the international community. We meet uh, regularly with very senior levels of the DRC. Uh, many of you know, that, for instance, that our Africa Forces Commander, General Carter Hamm, uh, was recently in the DRC. 
Uh, we've had a number of very senior leaders from the State Department out to engage in this kind of a dialogue, and obviously when we receive DRC officials here, uh, this is uh, one of the very top priorities. So I would, I would just focus on those areas. Okay, thank you. Ms. Bimba? Okay. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, first of all, to uh, Major Mpika, thank you for coming. Uh, Major Mpika for non Congolese is a legend in DRC. <laughs> He's an institution unto himself. So those of us who had military aspiration and other things grew up under his legend. Um, so f welcome, sir. The, uh, I think the point you raise go to the heart of the matter. Uh, the DRC, um, I mean, it's, it's a challenge because we're talking about a report here. I've lived in the U.S. for a long time. This is the first time, actually, I come to a forum where we're discussing security sector reform in DRC. So I think it's something that we should actually be thankful that is happening. It's never happened before. We talk about all kinds of things, but never the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is two-pronged. There's the democracy, Jack, you're mentioning, but the other side of democracy is what we're talking about. Yeah. Well, okay, sure. But we are where we are today. We are where we are today, and short of, what we short of, short of the ideal, what can we do now? Uh, if we're talking about violence in Kinshasa, that started after the election. I was in Kinshasa. I saw people whose ears were cut off as a violence, so I lived this violence. Uh, so for me personally as a Congolese, I'm very proud and very delighted that this discussion is being had. Um, the major mentioned all the problems. You mentioned some of the problems. But now, how do we push forward where we are? Do we go back fighting for democracy? Yes. But what do we do about the people being harassed by the security forces? Do we ignore it until democracy comes, as we see it? Or do we start somewhere and start pushing so that change will eventually come? Um, U.S. versus EU. It's very clear in the report. Um, it's obvious that I think some of you have not received the report. It's coming out today. So if you didn't have the chance, I think it's outside. You should get a copy. It's very detailed which recommendation is for whom and what needs to be done. Um, uh, as far as the, um, I, th I think there's been a lot of fora about democracy since the, since the botched elections. Uh, the, po the position of the U.S. has shifted somewhat uh, since the election happened. Uh, we wish that the U.S. had been more forceful in condemning the irregularities when they were happening pre-elections, as we did in Senegal. I mean, some of us cried when we heard the successful transition that took place in Senegal. We cried of pride for the Senegalese, but we cried also because of disappointment about what happened in DRC. Uh, the people of DRC fought a lot, but they didn't get the support they needed uh, from the international community. Uh, the U.S. for sure did not denounce what needed to be denounced. I do return from Congo in July, sat over here, when the U.S. ambassador was painting the rosiest of pictures uh, leading to the election. Uh, I was just baffled. Um, but we are where we are. So I'm happy that we're here. I'm happy that we can, let's start this discussion. Um, if you read the report, you see that there's a lot of specific recommendations for everyone, including the Congolese government. This is the first time we're ca calling the Congolese government to do its mission. I think it's an important we have a State Department representative to discuss this. We can ask you a question. I think that's very important. Thank you very much. Amanda. Just a few small precisions on the elements of the preoccupation posed. For the Major André Pika, in fact, Lorsque l'on parle de la situation de la, du Congo de l'Est, c'est juste à titre d'illustration. Mais la réforme du secteur de sécurité, c'est la réforme de la République démocratique du Congo. Ce n'est pas une réforme pratiquement pour l'Est. Mais l'Est, c'est juste un cas d'illustration parce que c'est là que se vivent un certain nombre d'exactions le plus horribles c'est là que vous trouvez une multitude de groupes armés et c'est même là que nos forces de sécurité se retrouvent également dans 
dans tous ces abus. Donc, l'ex, c'est pratiquement le miroir de la température sécuritaire euh, du pays. C'est pour cela qu'on parle de l'Est à titre d'illustration. Mais pratiquement, le cas de l'Est a eu un effet d'entraînement parce que lors des élections, on a vécu des, des histoires horribles aussi dans les autres parties du pays, euh, dans mmh. la capitale Kinshasa et même au centre du pays, en Bujima, il y a Kananga. Il y a eu en fait un peu comme une sorte de... Euh, de continuité de la violence dans toute cette province là où le policier militaire suffisamment armé avait une gâchette facile et si vous lisez l'un des rapports de notre réseau sur le monitoring sécuritaire de, des élections vous trouverez qu'on parle également de situations sécuritaires qui posent problème dans les autres parties du pays mais le cas de l'Est on le cite à titre d'illustration, comme on ne sait pas gonfler le rapport de tout le cas. Mais le rapport concerne la situation globale euh, du pays. Ça, c'est juste un élément de réponse. Il y a également le compatriote qui a parlé de... Que, on ne parle que des États-Unis. Au fait, c'est parce que nous nous retrouvons aux États-Unis que nous parlons des États-Unis. Mais les rapports ciblent aussi d'autres partenaires. On parle en termes de partenaires à la République démocratique du Congo dans le cadre de ce processus ici. Le même plaidoyer que nous sommes en train de faire aux États-Unis est en train de se faire au pays et la semaine prochaine, nous le lançons euh, pratiquement pour la partie européenne. Donc, on va le lancer en France. Également, ça, le même plaidoyer, on va le faire euh, en Allemagne. On le fait en Belgique et en Grande-Bretagne, on a juste ciblé les grandes capitales européennes qui peuvent d'une manière ou d'une autre peser sur le processus congolais. Donc, euh, ici, nous sommes aux États-Unis, donc on ne pouvait que parler prioritairement des États-Unis dans ce rapport parce qu'on se retrouve aux États-Unis. Mais euh, ces rapports ciblent également l'Union européenne et quelques pays qui ont en fait une voix. Euh, au niveau de l'Europe par rapport à la situation de la réforme du secteur de sécurité au Congo. Euh, en revenant maintenant sur notre ami qui, qui dit que la démocratie, on n'en parle pas, le problème c'est qu'on en a tellement trop parlé qu'à un moment donné, euh, on se perd même dans le concept démocratie. La problématique que nous soulevons, c'est une, une problématique de gouvernance sécuritaire en fait, un peu qui est un des éléments capital dans un système démocratique. Donc, on ne pouvait pas simplement ici intituler démocratie, réforme du secteur sécuritaire. Mais nous, on est en train de parler d'une problématique réelle de gouvernance sécuritaire qui a un effet sur le fonctionnement de démocratique. Donc, on pouvait, si on parlait des élections, peut-être que le discours serait plus orienté vers euh, les aspects démocratiques. Peut-être que parce que vous n'avez pas vu le mot « démocratie » dans, dans l'intitulé que vous avez pensé qu'on n'a pas fait allusion à la démocratie. Le fait que l'on parle déjà de cette problématique de gouvernance sécuritaire qui est vraiment un élément déterminant dans le fonctionnement démocratique d'un pays, d'une manière ou d'une autre, on parle de la démocratie sans la nommer. Voilà quelques éléments de réponse que vous avez à donner. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, we have to finish in just about five minutes. The last hand I saw was here and one right back there, and those are the only two I'm going to be able to take. I am sorry for that. Make your comments and questions very short. Yes, I'm Albert Moleka, uh, Mr. Tisekedi's chief of staff and spokesperson, and also a prison chaplain for 18 years. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the uh, democracy issue although that's the most important issue as far as the, the, the people in the Congo are concerned uh, right now. But uh, concerning the report, I think I agree with uh, Bemba in, uh, when he says that uh, it's wonderful that we start talking about that uh, issue now, especially at Washington. But then, uh, again, it's um, a little bit awkward as far as I'm concerned because I'm in, in direct touch and relations with um, the international community through embassies and ambassadors. So, and uh, it's difficult to understand there's a kind of paradox. 
on one hand, uh, people say we are working or acknowledging uh, the Kabila regime because he has the army. And on the other hand, what we are saying, we have to reform the security sector and there is a lack of political will uh, you know, on the part of the, the same person that we accept to work with because he has the, the army. Um, I would like also to, to, to greet Major Pika and uh, just saying that um, Zaire and the t at the time and uh, Congo, because it's still the same country, has invested a lot in the military. In the sense that even today we don't need uh, uh, foreign trainers. Mm. You know that uh, we have the capability right now, uh, within 12 or 16 months, even to create two, three divisions and to help, you know, bringing peace in the eastern, in eastern, in the eastern part of the country. That's something concrete. That's something practical that we can work with together. As um, as a political actor, I try also to um, to maintain that uh, dialogue with security forces, the police, and the army, because you know these are what we call service républicain. They should be mm -hmm. apolitic, apolitical, mm -hmm. and you can't imagine how many uh, high officers in the military in the police and uh, in the uh, in the security the security service are just waiting for an opportunity just to do their job which is to uh, bring security to the congolese society mm -hmm. so i do think that um, a lot of pressure must be exercised of course by the international community but at the same time the international community has uh, also shown its limits as far as the Congolese situation is concerned, and I think we have to encourage and support much more the work of the international civil society, because sometimes the political, uh, the political environment is uh, under pressure also of uh, financial and uh, economic interests, which are not very compatible with the people of the Congo's interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Oleka. Okay, one more comment question. Make it very short, please. <laughs> My name is Oleg Kolek. Okay. <laughs> uh, first of all, it's very important. That's your point. Thank you. Yes. Uh, My name is uh, Eve Bashonga. I'm from DRC Embassy here in Washington, D.C. And uh, my point is, uh, when we talk about the security sector reform, does not mean police, army, or the law. No, Seri security sector reform involves education, health, agriculture. It's all in the structure of uh, everything which functions in the country. But uh, here, uh, since, we focus, since, we, since we focus on uh, police and army, I can give you a few examples which prove that uh, the political will is there, but what we don't have maybe the speeds where people will want to see the change or the strategy. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So finish, finish your so when remark. When, 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 when we talk about political will, now in army we have codes of conduct published in four official language in Congo, and I'm telling you now, each military, each police have a copy of that code of conduct. For many years, people didn't know the number okay. of military we have in Congo. Now we are able to know exactly the personnel mm -hmm. in army and the police. That is political will. And if I go... Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You you have your fellow citizens here. You can uh, you can talk with a little bit later about the, uh, what's happening in terms of the broadening of security sector reform. Okay, one very quick comment. <laughs> Quickly. Thank you so much for speaking up for me. <laughs> My
my name is Karen Staus. I'm with an organization named Free the Slaves. And um, Carl, I definitely appreciated the point about the connection between stability and democracy and justice, but just wanted to make the point about um, sometimes the priority has been for short and medium term stability, which do not necessarily have to go along with democracy and justice. And I think some of the um, support for the arrangement with Bosco and Taganda in Eastern Congo is just one example of how you know that doesn't necessarily pay off in the long term. Um, but I wanted to ask a question about building the political will, since that's been the main um, conclusion of the report. And uh, so I have questions about um, would it be helpful in building the political will for both the DRC government and also for donor governments, including the United States, if companies who have US-based companies who've become much more engaged in the Congo because of the conflict of minerals issue were also to engage more in pressure on some of these issues like elections, democracy, mm -hmm. security sector reform in particular, would that be helpful in influencing the Congolese government a as well as the U.S. government. Um, and also for Emmanuel, I wanted to ask about building the political will inside of Congo. And again, this connects directly to the democracy issue. Um, does the network of organizations have as a strategy building grassroots support? Because it's I think it's wonderful that civil society in general um, is connected to this issue, but what about um, just grassroots community organizing? Is that part of the strategy so that at the very, very local level where it sometimes seems that democracy will really have to come in Congo, um, is that part of the strategy? Thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to let those questions go unanswered, but I think Emmanuel will be here for a little while afterwards to, uh, uh, to, to respond because we have finished with our webcast and we have to bring it to a close now. Uh, we did begin with a woman, then we ended with a woman, so that wasn't too bad. <laughs> Thank you very much, Cindy. Thank you all for coming. This has been interesting. We appreciate your passion. We appreciate your engagement, and this has been very good. Thank our panel, please. <laughs>